Um, my name is Si Chen. I'm the Chinese Studies Librarian at UC San Diego. Um, I want to welcome you to Professor Paul Pigori's book talk today. Uh, UC San Diego Library is very pleased to co-host this virtual event with the uh, university's 21st Century China Center. Uh, the center is a leading university-based think tank that produces uh, scholarly research and informs policy discussions on China and U.S.-China relations. Um, Sam Choi, the assistant director of the center, is also here today, and he will be helping facilitate the Q&A session. Uh, professor Pickowitz is a distinguished professor of history and Chinese studies amateurs at UC San Diego. He has been a longtime friend and supporter of the UC San Diego Library. We also have Professor Mika Moscalino as our moderator uh, for today's talk. Professor Moscalino is the endowed chair in modern Chinese history at UC San Diego. Uh, Professor Pickle's talk will be about 30 minutes. After that, Professor Moscalino will have a discussion with Professor Pickowitz. Then during the last 15 minutes or so, we will open the floor for questions. You can submit your questions in the Q&A box. So without further ado, I will turn the microphone to Professor Pickowitz. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to try to have a very pleasant and smooth uh, afternoon, one hour. Uh, I wanna start off by thanking a few people. Sam, of course, has done a marvelous job uh, in all respects for the 21st century uh, China Center at uh, UC San Diego. And I don't know what we do without him. Uh, the same is true for Xi, uh, our Chinese studies librarian. Uh, those of us who do research on China at the university, we would be totally lost without her leadership and guidance uh, in the library. So, so deeply appreciated. And I want to thank Micah for taking time today to join us and serving as MC, a uh, fabulous colleague uh, in the history department. Uh, and um, I also, I took a quick uh, look yesterday at the list of people who've signed up for the event. I'm not sure who's actually on now, uh, but uh, I wanna thank former and current undergraduate students uh, at UC San Diego, uh, former and current PhD students, not, at, not just at UC San Diego, but also U I see the U UC Irvine crowd is, uh, is signed on. Um, I wanna thank members of the community uh, and uh, the colleagues, uh, former colleagues, current colleagues, it's just a long list of people whose names I recognize. I want to mention in particular two people uh, who began their visits to China j just slightly after the visit I, I'm going to talk about today, and that's Richard Kagan uh, and Bill Joseph. Uh, Bill has also contributed his uh, images uh, from his trip in 1972 to our library collection. We're, we're deeply grateful, but uh, I'm hoping they will uh, chime in later with uh, comments and observations. Uh, so it's the sequence of events we're talking about that led to this book are the following. A number of years ago, I donated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of slides that I took of my 1971 visit to China, and they were digitized in the library. Anyone, anywhere in the world can gain access to this collection. Uh, and, uh, and that's what happened. Uh, uh, some colleagues at City University uh, in Hong Kong saw the slides and they approached us uh, about, you know, would you like to do a book uh, based on the trip? And uh, we'll use some photographs, you know, we might use, as many as 150 photographs. I was completely blown away. Usually in a book, we'll have six or eight photographs, but 150 photographs, that was amazing. Um, and it so happened that I had written, at about the time they made their inquiry, I had written a short paper, uh, prelimin let's call it a preliminary paper about my trip for a conference. And so, you know, we put our heads together, uh, she and I, and uh, let's go ahead and do this. And so the book is based entirely on my diaries, uh, very lengthy handwritten diaries that I took at the time, uh, and all of the images. Uh, and so I expanded the preliminary paper I had already written. Uh, so the goal today is to keep everything very, very informal. Uh, we want to get to the comments and questions as quickly as possible. And I keep on having to remind myself that I'm talking today about something that happened 50 years ago. I mean, almost virtually to the day, 50 years ago, I showed up in Hong Kong uh, as a PhD student uh, preparing for a year of dissertation research. I was 24 years old at the time, and I have to keep on pinching myself and trying to remember that this was a long time ago, uh, and then trying to bring it all back to life in some way. And the fact is, it all started in Hong Kong. 
It all started in Hong Kong and we shouldn't forget that. I think younger people in the field now don't realize the way the field functioned 50 years ago when you were doing dissertation research you could stay in the United States and use university libraries there. You could go to Taiwan, which many people did, and use libraries uh, and archives there. You could go to Hong Kong uh, and use materials that were available there. That's what I decided to do. And it was my first trip to Asia. It was my first trip to Hong Kong. Uh, I was 24 years old. So it started in Hong Kong. There were no China research op options. There, was no way, there were no ways to go to China. This is what we all wanted to do. And I say in the book, if you study Germany, you want to visit Germany. If you study uh, you know, uh, Jordan, you want to go to Jordan. It, 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 this is only normal and natural, but we had no such options. In fact, living in Hong Kong, we noticed that uh, the tourists would take the bus uh, up to the border and stand on a hill and look over to what was called Red China, uh, so they could at least tell their friends they had seen Red China. Um, there were no diplomatic relations between the United States and China at the time. And uh, no university-based scholars of China had been able to visit China since 1949. And so uh, naturally, this is something we wanted to do, but there was apparently no way to do it. And so the bottom line is uh, the group of uh, young scholars who were based at the University Service Center on Argyle Street in those days. Now it's at Chinese U. Uh, we met, we formed a little collective. We were very interested. We studied different subjects. I was researching the 1920s and 30s. Uh, but we decided, now let's, let's try. Uh, what, what's wrong with trying to figure out a way to go to China if it was at all possible? We were very lucky. We, it, bottom line is we were incredibly lucky. Uh, we had no idea what was going on diplomatically behind the scenes. Uh, and it's clear at that point in fall 1970, uh, there were things going on behind the scenes, but nobody knew about it. Uh, we made some contacts uh, in the China-linked press in Hong Kong. Uh, and these people offered suggestions. They were not optimistic. We were not optimistic. I was not optimistic, but why not try? And then surprise, surprise, we got an invitation uh, to visit China in June and July of 1971. And I talk about the background, how that invitation came to pass and the contacts that were made and how the thing unfolded in, in the book in great detail. Uh, I think probably the most important thing to mention about our mentality at the time as 20 some year olds was we saw ourselves engaged in something that we like to call people to people diplomacy. So the governments, you know, have their problems. And actually today, <laughs> reading the newspaper, New York Times today, uh, we're, we're, we're back to that in some ways. You know, the governments have their problems and there's a lot of scary talk going on and confrontation and so forth. But we were uh, thinking, you know, let's do something called people to people diplomacy. And if we could, you know, get on this trip and, and if finally we were invited, we went on the trip, uh, let's make contact. We, we are, have people from various backgrounds. Uh, let's try to establish people to people uh, relationships. But the question about the book was how to write it. And I do have to explain the title. The title is called A Sensational Encounter with high socialist China. So before we go ahead, I need to explain the title because I had to think about the invitation from City U to write the book. How was I going to do it? And I am not a great fan of the autobiography genre. I'm not a great fan of the memoir genre. I wanted to do something a little bit different. So the first organizational method that I used was to focus on the five senses. This is why the book is called a sensational encounter with high socialist China. And so the question for June and July 1971 is that I raise in the book in five chapters, what did China smell like at that time? What did China sound like? What did it look like? What did it taste like? And what did it, what was it like to the touch in a tactile sense? What was it like? So I organized the trip. I organized the book, not in terms of the chronology of the trip. I thought it would be really boring to say, well, on days such and such, we entered China, then we did this, and then we did that, and then we went to Shanghai, and then we did this. A strictly chronological. I thought that would be pretty boring. So I decided to organize it in a non-chronological way, according to the five senses. That was the first uh, decision I made. The second decision I made is this idea of high socialist China. What in the world does that mean? 
Uh, I was Again, I was trying to freeze the moment and disabuse people of the idea that, well, China in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, all the way on up to this present day, China is basically the same. No, it's not the same. Uh, there are qualitative differences. And that's what historians do, try to unpack what different peri uh, periods of time look like. And so I, I give it the name High Socialist China. And I define it, I bookend it very, very specifically. That is to say, I define High Socialist China as the period from spring 1969 to the fall of 1971, just after our departure from China. And I call this High Socialist China because we're talking about freezing a moment of self-identity. This is the way uh, Chinese leaders were talking about that moment. Uh, from the Ninth Party Congress, when Lin Biao, you know, is designated as uh, Mao Zedong's successor. Uh, he's identified as Chairman Mao's closest comrade in arms and successor. Um, and it's a period in which the military was playing extraordinarily high profile uh, role in China. And you'll see that in a minute. Um, and basically the argument being made by the leaders is there is no socialist operation or socialist enterprise in the world as progressive as ours now. Certainly not the Soviet Union. That's a revisionist pit. Uh, the Eastern European countries, satellites of the Soviet Union, yeah, no, they were also knee deep in revisionism. Uh, and there were places worth talking about, uh, North Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. But of course, in this imagery, they're not anywhere at the level China is at. China is at the cutting edge of the world socialist revolution, the most advanced socialist revolutionary project in world history. And this is what we were exposed to day in and day out during this visit. Uh, and so I decided to uh, use that as part of the title, freeze this moment uh, from uh, spring of 1969 to the fall of 1971. Of course, everything crashes. And I talk about this in the book, it, everything crashes and burns in the fall of 1971 when um, Chairman Mao's closest comrade in arms and successor uh, is accused of trying to carry out a coup to assassinate him and who is killed in a plane uh, crash that appears to be uh, headed to the Soviet Union. It crashes in, in Mongolia uh, and so forth. So, so this is the framing. It's the middle of the Cultural Revolution uh, when, we, when we were there. Um, and um, it was a lot like uh, what some people have told me, I've never been to North Korea, but some people told me going on tours of North Korea now, it's pretty much like this. Uh, you, you, uh, you, you see all of the, the highlights, this is what you're exposed to. And that brings to, me, uh, to, to mind the third organizational premise that I use. So we've got the five senses, we've got the high socialist moment, spring 69 to fall 71. The third thing I do is a great deal with theatricality and staging and performance. Uh, and so, but I don't talk about one or two. I actually talk about three stagings that are going on simultaneously. The, uh, three theatrical performances that are going on simultaneously. The first one is what I call the larger production, and that's the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution theater that we're exposed to, you know, literally every day. And this is going on without us. This has nothing to do with us. This was going on throughout China, uh, virtually every part of China uh, during this period. And so it's the the larger production that's that, that's happening, the, the larger uh, theater uh, and staging that's going on. The smaller production, the second kind of production I talk about, is the one that is being organized for us. Every unit, model unit we go to, uh, every uh, presentation that we're exposed to, uh, these are stage performances. These are productions, some of them very lavish, uh, uh, and so forth. So you have the larger production, you have the smaller production within that. And then the third production they talk about is our own production. That is to say, we fancied that we were there doing people to people uh, diplomacy. We wanted to see improvement in the relations between the United States and China, which were essentially non-existent as far as we know at this time. Um, and uh, so we are also trying to represent the American people and doing this in various theatrical and performative ways. Uh, and so I, I do quite a bit of this in the book as well. Uh, so that's enough of that. Uh, so what I want to do now is, if, ever, if we have a miracle here, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures and run through this very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to do the share screen. 
and I'm going to click on this. Okay, so far so good. Now we're going to do view and we're going to do slideshow. Okay, there we go. Can everybody see that? I hope everybody can see that well. Uh, Chi, are we okay? It looks good? Okay, so this is the group. This is the group. Um, I know you're struggling to figure out which one is me. Uh, keep on looking, keep on looking. Okay, upper left. If you said upper left, that's me. Uh, but there are lots of people here that, I mean, the group was incredibly diverse in terms of where they came from and what they were doing, even down to their political and social thinking. I mean, all of us were uh, active in the movement uh, to oppose the war in Vietnam. We were very active in uh, things related to what was called at the time women's liberation and so forth. But there was a great diversity within that framework. So the guy in the dead center, Tony Garaventi, he was a veteran. He had served in the military in the US Army. Uh, the guy on the lower left, uh, Ray Whitehead, was a Protestant missionary living in Hong Kong. Uh, the, the, the lower right, uh, sitting on the steps there with the striped uh, outfit, is Susan Shirk who later is a colleague now to this day. She's uh, the, the leader of the 21st Century China Center here at UC San Diego, dear friend of mine for many, many years. Uh, and she was a grad student at the time at MIT. Um, and uh, she later uh, did some work for the State Department and so forth. So we have a, a wide variety of people here and, and views. Uh, so let's continue. So this is the group. Oh, that's my calligraphy at the bottom. Zhu Meirin and Yo Hao once way I wrote that. And a pretty shaky calligraphy, but we, this is a, a photograph that we gave out in various parts of China uh, to various people. So there's that element of touch. You know, we talk about the five senses and um, one couldn't help but noticing how much of the uh, labor that was being done in China everywhere we went in these model units or just looking at the street was people touching equipment, touching, you know, you're building a, a home in Northwest China, you know, you just, you don't wait for the machines. This was an idea, uh, a concept of high socialist China where you don't wait for the machines, you move along, you move along uh, as quickly as you can using uh, power of the, of the human body. And so this is the theme of touch that I go into uh, in the book. And there was also this uh, uh, related theme of, especially if you're an intellectual, and we all were regarded by our Chinese hosts as intellectuals, young intellectuals, uh, of course, but uh, intellectuals in particular had an obligation to do a lot of touching, participate in labor. This was the Chinese term, you participate in labor. So this picture is a, of a professor from Beijing University uh, who was at a May 7th cadre school, and he's making pails. And we were told this is a wonderful thing for intellectuals to be, to be doing, to participate in labor. I can't tell you how many times we heard this uh, as a, an important thing for everyone to do, but especially intellectuals. So I decided, sure, why not do it? That's me in the middle of grabbing a hoe uh, at a people's commune. And do, now some of the uh, guides who are uh, taking us around look a little nervous uh, about this, uh, but you know, taking seriously this idea that participating in labor, grabbing onto the tool and, and doing some farm work. My, my grandparents were farmers, and so it wasn't totally alien to me, uh, but uh, it, did, it did get some surprising looks, but we, we were very insistent on, on that. Uh, and then of course, just the novelty of being there. This is part of the visual aspect. You're looking and you're being looked at. So this is a picture taken on the Great Wall. It's very revealing in terms of the kinds of clothing women uh, were wearing in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, kinds of hairstyles. Uh, and you'll notice nobody has a wristwatch. I mean, it was extraordinarily uh, rare in those days to see anybody with a wristwatch. The, I love the picture of the little girl on the left. She's just, you know, she can't believe what, what she's seeing here. This is really interesting. Who are these people? These are Americans, you know, no way, no way. So uh, that, was, uh, that was enjoyable everywhere we went. Even here's a little village we visited. Um, extremely interesting. You see the kids and the way they're dressed. Uh, none of them have shoes or sandals. They're all barefoot. Uh, you know, very, very common at the time. Uh, many of them, most of them have their Mao badges on, uh, but no, no footwear, no sandals. 
uh, or shoes, they're farm kids. Uh, again, not, not terribly surprising. So again, that touch element. And then uh, everywhere we went, uh, this is the time when the revolutionary committees, not the party, the party committees had been overthrown in China. Uh, in the early stages of the Cultural Revolution. And so the Revolutionary Committees were dominated by military in uniform. So this is a visit we paid to a hospital uh, and greeted immediately as we're getting off the bus by the uh, Revolutionary Committee dominated by military figures. And in this particular hospital, we were going to be shown an example of progress in Chinese science, medical science, where uh, patients undergoing surgery were going to be uh, receiving uh, anesthesia, we were told, only by acupuncture, and they would be awake during the procedures. I'd never been in a hospital watching anyone getting operated on before. That particular day, we saw four operations. We, you know, scrubbed down and put on surgical gowns, stood beside the surgeons as they did Here's, in this case, they removed an ovarian cyst from a young woman. Uh, and it was extremely uh, uh, interesting for me to be standing there. Uh, the woman was, appeared to be conscious, as they said. They took out an ovarian cyst about the size of a baseball. Uh, and um, again, this I talk about this in, the, in both the touch chapter uh, and in the uh, visual chapter. Uh, uh, kids, uh, you know, uh, Adults were wearing, you know, very uh, straightforward, simple outfits, but the young kids could be very colorful and dressed uh, in, in a, a public park. Uh, and you'll notice, especially the young girls uh, dressed uh, in a very colorful way. This, this was uh, interesting to see. And a couple of them have these supersized Mao badges. Uh, wonderful. Uh, this is uh, in terms of sound, in the sound chapter, I spend quite a bit of time on this visit we made to a militia group in, uh, uh, in Nanjing. Uh, and this was a people's militia group and they were firing all sorts of weapons. This was very loud, uh, uh, machine guns, howitzers. And you'll notice some of the uh, militia members are, are basically young kids. Uh, also very interesting to see. They're dressed in their little red, the armband they're wearing says little red guard, uh, and uh, they are part of the people's militia, you know. And, and you have to remember that just a couple of years before, uh, back in the spring of, of, of 69, I talked about the beginning of this high socialist period. In 1969, there was a border conflict between the Soviet Union and China. And this idea that there was, you know, there could possibly be an invasion of China by the Soviet Union, and that everyone, including these little kids, had to be ready. Uh, and they were pretty good uh, with their weapons. Uh, and, but it was very noisy, and I talk about the sound of high socialism, and some of the young kids, uh, uh, young girls, as well as young boys, uh, uh, were very welcoming, uh, and we were very impressed by their by their skills. Uh, and of course, visually, the Mao cult was in very, very high gear everywhere. Literally, you went in villages. And, and again, this is part of the larger Cultural Revolution stage production. This isn't for our benefit. This is at the uh, Shanghai Exhibition Hall. Uh, and I'm quite sure, I'd say 99.9% .9 sure, that this statue has been taken down. Uh, it's not there today, although the exhibition hall is there. Uh, but this is an example of uh, the cult of personality. Uh, if you went to North Korea today, you'd get exposed to the same kind of thing. Um, and uh, this is an, an example of the way it looked uh, throughout China. Uh, and then visually, uh, this is a, vis a visit to a primary school. And uh, there's this extraordinarily orderly presentation, again, is partly the theater that I'm talking about, the small production within the big production. And you have, you know, the quotations from Chairman Ma, almost as religious texts, almost like a little Bible uh, that's at the top of each student's desk, very nicely placed, their arms are folded, you know, in a very uniform kind of way. This was a primary school. And back to the hospital, this was extraordinarily interesting. This is another fellow uh, who had some surgery uh, done with, with me standing by the surgeon. And um, I mean, literally, what I call in the book, uh, my, my book, I call the, the, sacred, the sacred text is literally three inches from his head during the surgery. And when the surgery was over, he was asked to say something. And the first thing he said was, I want to thank Chairman Mao for the surgery and the marvelous recovery you know, that, uh, that, I've, that I've made. 
so again, you've got visual here, you've got touch going on. Here's more touch. This is a place in Guangzhou. This is a school for uh, students who are uh, deaf and mute. Uh, and again, the military is in charge of the Revolutionary Committee and they are uh, doing, again, acupuncture. This is a way of showing, you know, we can't just rely on so-called Western science. Uh, you know, we're doing our own developments in the scientific field, and this is uh, acupuncture use to help uh, improve the lives and conditions of uh, deaf mute students. But again, you see the arms folded in this nice, clear way, uh, the, the sacred text, you know, present there, uh, the military, uh, in this case, two women uh, from the army, uh, in, you know, present in this high socialist moment. We went to places where artists work, and of course, the themes in art. This is part of the visual chapter that I write about. This was a, a support for the uh, 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 Vietnamese revolutionary cause, and the gun is actually being, you know, modeled there. This is the gun that she's doing. Um, and again, who could have imagined in summer of 1971 that eight years later China and Vietnam would be at war on their northern on the northern border of Vietnam? So again, uh, very very. At this point, it looks like uh, this is a closer relationship. Uh, again, uh, this is in Suzhou, there's, you know, wonderful late imperial uh, gardens and temples, but then you could get this huge mural uh, put on, uh, on, the, uh, on the walls. And, and this is all about, uh, you know, uh, the people's, and again, the high socialist moment was a time when the Chinese leadership is saying, we are the leaders of the revolutionary peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And here you see them uh, with, the, with the, you know, representations from different kinds of areas. And it basically says, uh, you know, US imperialism, uh, you know, the people of Asia you know, are gonna do something to get US imperialism out of Asia. Uh, so here you see this old antique building and then this new mural. Uh, we did some people's diplomacy. Uh, in this case, we asked to visit with Prince Nordam Sihanouk, um, who was uh, in exile in Beijing because the government in Phnom Penh was a government basically installed by the U.S. side, very close to the U.S. side during the uh, Vietnam War, uh, and he's in exile. And we met with him for quite a while. He had quite a taste for French pastries and uh, caviar and so forth. We were uh, treated very nicely. I've talked about what we ate and drank there uh, because we were with a prince. And um, he, that's me, by the way, in the background, uh, taking a look at him. I had the kind of long hair. Uh, at that time, uh, a lot longer than it is now. Um, and uh, uh, that was uh, very interesting. We met with Joe and Lai, uh, and it wasn't just a cameo visit, um, you know, uh, let's say, uh, you know, five minute visit where you get a photo taken. No, we met with Joe and Lai on the evening of July 19th for four hours in the Great Hall of the People from eight o'clock at night until midnight. And I talk quite a bit in the book about some of the interesting things that happened in that meeting, things that were obvious. If, for example, I talk in the book about how during this four hour meeting, he predicts the timing of his own death. And he was absolutely right. He said, I, 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 we don't have time to go into the story. Somebody could ask about it later, but he basically indicated that, you know, by the summer of 1976, he would be dead and he was. Uh, he also said some other things that we didn't get uh, that were talking about the Chinese political situation at the moment. Again, if anybody wants to ask me about that, uh, come on back to it. Um, uh, it's in the book, but we could also discuss it later. He made an extremely, uh, uh, at the time we thought it was just a routine comment, but it turned out later in the light of the collapse of the high socialist moment and the death of Lin Biao, uh, he made a comment that actually uh, foreshadowed some problems in domestic politics, but again, we didn't get it. Um, yeah, so we spent four hours with him. Uh, and this was, I think the reason he wanted to meet with us is there was no internet in those days. Uh, there were very few foreign correspondents in, uh, in Beijing. And what had happened was while we were in China, Henry Kissinger made his secret visit uh, to China to arrange for the visit of Richard Nixon the following spring. 
And uh, we were totally surprised and shocked by that. Uh, and there were some of China's allies, the Vietnamese were concerned about this and, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think one of the things Joe wanted to do was to use our visit as an opportunity to explain why the invitation was made to Nixon, who was up until that time in the propaganda that we, we were exposed to, he was the commander in chief of uh, worldwide imperialist uh, forces. And so why in the world would he be invited to China? So that's again, part of what happened in that meeting and part of why I think he invited us. And uh, uh, here's the, he said the next day, that's uh, July 20th, uh, 1971, he said, Your pho the photograph will be taken and be placed in the People's Daily. And sure enough, it was there the next day. And you'll notice, Joe's in the center, count over two people to the right, that's Yao Wenyuan, uh, and count two people to the left, that's Zheng Chunqiao. So these are two of his uh, close uh, associates, uh, spent the entire four hours with us uh, at the meeting, also spoke themselves. Uh, and of course, as many of you probably know, again, uh, this is the high socialist moment when these people are in a very, very high uh, position, uh, but um, who could have again known at this particular time that uh, in the aftermath of Mao's death in 1976, these two men would be arrested and spend the rest of their lives in prison uh, as part of the, uh, what was called the Gang of Four, including Mao's wife, uh, and one other person, Wang Hongwen, but we actually met Zhang Chunqiao, Yao Wenyuan, uh, and they arranged some activities for us as well. Um, I was asked by the group to, we had this little souvenir button to, to, to give to Joe, uh, and um, I was asked by the group to give him the button. I decided to pin it right on his shirt, and you can see this is kind of great concern there that I might botch it, you know, I might stick him with the pin, and where, to the extreme right, that's actually Zhang Chunqiao looking on, a little bit worried, you know, about this, but it turned out all right. The button got on there, I gave him a photograph, the one that you've seen, uh, and we shook hands, and, uh, uh, and so forth. So we left China. Uh, by this time, the news, of course, about Nixon's visit was, uh, was out there in the world. And there was just the foreign press corps in Hong Kong was desperate to meet with the group as it exited China, because we had been to China, we had been there, we were there for four weeks, we met with Joe, he talked about the Nixon visit. And so the foreign press wanted to talk to us because they were trying to write stories about what was going on in China. So this is a press conference at the Foreign Correspondence Club uh, in Hong Kong. So, uh, you know, basically, this was a uh, a grand adventure for a 24-year-old grad student. Uh, suddenly, you know, press conferences and, you know, who could have imagined, you know, going to Hong Kong to do dissertation research on the 1920s and 30s, that it would have ended up this way. But the way I think about it, it's like, you know, sometimes opportunities present themselves uh, and you just have to say, you know what, I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to jump in and uh, see what happens in this adventure. So there I am. I jumped in. <laughs> this is in Nanjing. Uh, you jump in and uh, 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 and uh, learn as much as you can. So we're going to stop there. And uh, I'm going to hit the stop share, I think, right? OK. Are we good? OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to Micah. Okay, yes, we are good. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Paul for that talk and also congratulate him for the publication of what is a, a really fun book. Um, you know, it's, it's a great uh, volume, uh, first and foremost, because of the photographs, especially uh, the last one that you showed there, which I'm sure a lot of people got a kick out of. But also, you know, the, the text of it is also quite lively and fun to read. So um, yeah, I think that a lot of people will enjoy having it. And it's the kind of book that you can just sort of put on a table and flip through it and it's accessible and the pictures are colorful and lively. And so um, I think that everybody will get quite a kick out of looking at it. So um, I'm sure many of our attendees and we have quite a few of them uh, have questions. And I know with some certainty that nobody logged on to this webinar to listen to me talk, but I do want to just sort of get things started by asking a couple of questions of Paul, and then we'll immediately turn to the audience. So 
Um, believe it or not, the biggest event to occur in China in 1971, as you already indicated, wasn't your visit. Um, it was the death of Lin Biao and what you, I think, aptly characterize as the end of this high socialist moment. Um, so could you talk a little bit about those moments during your visit that looked different or you could understand more fully after the um, moment at which Lin Biao passed away and the whole power dynamic within the PRC changed. Yeah, very, again, I'm going to try to keep my answers brief because I'd, I'd love to get as many questions from you and other people as possible. But basically, as the pictures show, it was the visibility of the military everywhere. Uh, now, it's true at this time at the provincial level, we had noticed this in Hong Kong, some of the provincial level revolutionary committees were being transformed back to party committees. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, there was no inclination to do this at the time, but that you could read that as bad news for the military, even though there were still military people on those party committees. But basically at the grassroots everywhere we went, the revolutionary committees were dominated by military uniform. And Lin Biao's picture together with Mao was all over the place. I mean, absolutely everywhere you go. And there were all of these wonderful things being said about the military and, and, the, and the close relationship between the military you know, and the people and, and Chairman Mao and Mao often appeared in military uniform as well. So I would say that was the biggest, uh, you know, visual uh, difference. And, and of course, seeing the people's militia, uh, they insisted, you know, that we go and see the people's militia work. Um, so, uh, but I can very briefly say that uh, the thing that Joe and Lai mentioned that nobody picked up on is he mentioned at one point, he said, oh, you're here, you know, during the Cultural Revolution. I know you're interested in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but you need to know that the Cultural Revolution has gone through many stages. You know, okay, yeah, we knew that. And he said, now the present stage is called struggle, criticism, and transformation. I mean, okay, we knew that. Well, why is he talking about this? We know all, all of this. And then, and then he paused and he said, you know, uh, uh, today when you came in, you took the photograph, and that'll be in the paper tomorrow. But did you notice what was behind us when we took the photograph? No, we didn't notice. There's this big landscape painting, beautiful guohua in Chinese, beautiful landscape painting. And again, we're wondering, why is he talking about landscape paintings? And then he said, you know what was there until very recently? Quotations from Chairman Mao in gold and red. And he said, Chairman Mao walked into that room one day not him, Chairman Mao walked into that room one day and said, you know, this is not that good for backgrounds, for photographs. Let's do something like with a, you know, landscape painting and so forth. Then Joe paused and he said, you know, in this stage of the Cultural Revolution, you know, we need to, we need to downplay formalism, what he called formalism. And he had just given credit to Lin Biao for, you know, in the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, getting the quotations from Chairman Mao out, and this was a wonderful contribution in order to combat Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping and all these revisionists. But then you know, that pause, and but now we're at a different stage of the uh, of Cultural Revolution, and we need to cut back on the formalism. Now, after we left China, there was so much interest in not just our trip, but we made the transcript of this talk. He even said, if you'd like to record this talk, you can do that. And we did. And he said, feel free to publish it when you leave China. He wanted these words out there and he was using us for that purpose. And so we did publish it. But many years later, there's a guy who worked for the uh, LA Times, James Mann, it was a reporter. And he, uh, in the 1980s, in a freedom of information uh, move, he got documents from the CIA uh, about the CIA's internal studies of their own track record on getting it right in China. And lo and behold, in that one of the reports he found, much was redacted, but there was an, an omission, an a, 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 a admission in this report, that, oh, and their young graduate students came out of China and they circulated this talk with Joe. Joe Enlai says in there, there was too much formalism. He's basically saying Lin Biao is a goner. And the CIA is saying, we didn't get it. 
nobody got it, nobody read it that way, but in a matter of months, you go back and you reread that stuff and you get a very different kind of look uh, on that. And, and so that's an example of uh, how things uh, changed once that uh, the death of Limbiao took place and uh, Bill Joseph and the sef second group from the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars visited China in spring 72 after that. And it was, uh, I would say in some ways, a different place. I mean, that's so fascinating. And I think that, you know, one of the great things about the book is that it contains so many little gems like that. I mean, there are just these little moments that uh, speak volumes and you can find them throughout the book. You know, one of the other things that I like about the book is that even though it's clearly something that's very personal and, you know, your sort of authorial voice is very clear, it's not in any way self-referential or self-indulgent. It's a book that will, will show you a lot and help people understand what China was like in 1971 a lot better, but you're also, you know, transparent that, you know, this is, you know, mediated by your experience. So I wanted to ask you a question that is more about you. So you were, you know, 50 years ago, as you said, um, starting your PhD research in Hong Kong. And at that time, you were working on Chu Chou Bai, right? That was your, your dissertation topic, and it became an excellent book um, that really has stood the test of time. But then your subsequent research um, is quite different, right? Your extremely uh, well-known book about Wugong village in North China, um, and also your research on Chinese cinema. So the question that I wanted to ask was, how did that first experience in China, that first trip in 1971, influence the trajectory of your future research? Uh, huge. Thank you for the question, because it's in my life, it's been such an important uh, issue. I got addicted to the idea, this is the touch part, setting my feet on Chinese soil and just talking to people. Now, in those days, it was really hard to move away from all the theatricality going on uh, in model units. But as I kept on going back to China, and I still feel that way today, what I enjoy is interacting with people directly, talking to them. And again, this is, I guess, the legacy of the people to people thing. We took that seriously. And so again, we're in a time now of bad relations between the two governments. Hey, I, I'm still going to keep my people to people. And I'm doing a lot of correspondence with my friends now. They're saying the same thing in China now. They're saying we, we have to keep our relationships together. And so I got into a, doing a multi-year village research project. I wanted to do oral histories. I wanted to interview people. I got into a study of the Chinese film world, not just looking at films uh, of the 1920s, 30s, 40s, old films, but trying to track down people who were still alive, you know, in, in the late 70s and early 80s, who were active in that industry, and then talking to them. I just absolutely love the oral history uh, part of, of I mean, you know, there are many sources, and that's one kind of source. Uh, this is not to say other kinds of sources aren't important, but it got so much to the point where I actually got involved in documentary filmmaking and was involved in the production of six documentary films uh, called China in Revolution, six parts, uh, in which we went and did these oral histories. And I just never got that out of, out of, got that out of my system. I still feel that way now. Uh, when I go to China now, I just can't wait to get out on the street, uh, talk to somebody when I'm buying toothpaste in a shop, talking, you know, go to Starbucks and sit down with somebody and chit chat and so forth, talk to the cab drivers. You just learn so much. And so it, 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 it made me a different kind of researcher. You still have to hit the archives. You still have to, you know, hit the libraries and so forth. But for me, it just changed my whole life in terms of absolutely needing to have access to China. Not to say it was ever easy. There were always always people who wanted a block. You know, didn't want this done, didn't want that done. And but there were also other people very sympathetic. No, no, we should do that. We should do research on that. And so it's a, a, about memory. Memory is important. Yeah, that, that human dimension, that kind of person-to-person -person dimension, that personal dimension uh, comes across extremely clearly both in your research as well as in the many, many PhD dissertations that you've advised. That's, I know that's something that you really stress when you are teaching grad students and giving them advice about their research projects. And I think that's been a great service uh, to the field of modern Chinese history. And so I suspect that 
you know, a few of those uh, former PhD students are among our attendees. And so I want to now give everybody who is here uh, taking part in the webinar an opportunity to ask their questions. And I'm sure there are many of them. And Sam Soy is going to uh, take charge of calling on people. And uh, so, yeah, thanks again, Paul. Yes, great. Uh, we have uh, several questions here. I'm going to try my best to uh, read them in turn and also trying to bundle the similar ones. So the first question I have for you, Paul, is from uh, Ma Shrefe. Uh, could you elaborate a little more on the gendered dimension of the five senses in the high socialist period? Yeah. And how the gendered senses or even sensual gender may still be at work in contemporary China? Uh, thank you for this question, uh, because uh, it's actually a big component of the book. That is to say, it doesn't, you know, all five senses. Uh, one of the things that, one of the claims made uh, in the high socialist moment when we were in China, I mean, uh, th there was a keen awareness. Half of the people in our group were women. Uh, we were all uh, people who were involved at one level or another in what was called a women's liberation movement. And so the claim that was made that, oh, uh, in China, Nanu Pingdang, you know, men and women are equal. Oh, this is an interesting claim. But on the ground, we found yeah, no, not really. Uh, and we kept on raising questions about that. Um, and it did involve, you know, all of the senses. And so I tried as hard as I could in the book. Uh, uh, and this question almost to me feels like someone who's read the book and knows that I that I made an attempt to do this. Uh, I try to, in responding to the, the various uh, sensorial things that I was exposed to, to bring in the gendered component. You know, it was different. It was different from men, men and women's experiences in China were different and men and women's experiences in our own group were different. And I think it's absolutely crucial uh, to, to raise this question. Uh, and, uh, and I think you said part of the question was, uh, does that concern linger? Yeah, that concern lingers. Uh, it's still a question today, not just in China, uh, everywhere in the world, including right here in the USA, uh, we have uh, you know serious problems with respect to uh, gender equality, uh, and um, and I try to bring this out as much as I can from my diaries and from the images that I took uh, on, on on that visit. Thank you for the question. Great. Um, next, I'm going to bundle three questions relating to your conversation with Joe and Lai. So Victor asks, did Premier Zhou speak in English with you or relied entirely on his interpreter? Um, and then Rose Xu asks, um, do you still have any access to those firsthand recordings or documents from that four hour conversation? Um, and then Pamela Ratcliffe asks, do you think uh, Premier Zhou understood what sort of place your group occupied in the American political or social system? and what you could do to benefit China. So did he speak English? Any documents? And Let me did go he in reverse order. Let me go in reverse order. Because this name, Pamela Radcliffe, I've heard this name. Uh, I, I, I think I know this person. Uh, and uh, yes, he was, and that's why we were invited. Uh, this goes all the way back to the beginning of the book when I talk about how we pulled it off in Hong Kong uh, through our contacts there to actually get the invitation. Uh, they were very, because, oh, Keep in mind, I said no university-based academics had been in China, had been invited to China since 1949. But remember, just before we went in the spring of 1971, the U.S. table tennis team playing table tennis tournament in Japan, they didn't apply to go to China. They were just spontaneously invited. So this, again, was part of the behind the scenes. Uh, they're you know, the U.S. side and the Chinese side are talking in Warsaw and who knows the groundwork for uh, Kissinger's visit, Nixon visit. You know, this is probably already going 
going on secretly behind the uh, behind the scenes. And so there is an effort to bring in different kinds of groups. That's why I say we were just totally lucky. They were probably uh, attracted to us because we were saying we wanted to see better relations between China uh, and the U.S. And we kept on using the word people, the peoples of China and the U.S. Uh, and uh, so they definitely understood that we were people who uh, you know, were opposed to the war in Vietnam, uh, you know, and, and as, uh, allied with various kinds of progressive, you know, forces, at least as they were defined at the time. Uh, so uh, absolutely, I, he was aware. Uh, and uh, in terms of recordings, we did tape record the whole thing. The Chinese state, they actually filmed the whole thing. Uh, there was a there was a cameraman uh, filming the whole. You can actually see him in some of the photographs in the book. I don't know whatever happened to the film. It's in the archive somewhere in China. Uh, I don't know. Fifty years later, I don't know what happened to our sound recordings. But we use those recordings to recreate the whole uh, four hours of the evening, and uh, that was the foundation for it. And a very interesting story about it is we published it. Uh, you know, and you can you can find that still. Uh, we did a book when we left China in 1972 called China Inside the People's Republic, a group a book. There was quite a demand for so-called first-hand accounts of China on the eve of Nixon's visit, and uh, the the uh, the uh, the conversation with Joe, the four-hour conversation, is in there. But we also, uh, you know, Yao Wenyuan spoke, Jiang Chunxiao spoke, and so forth. And I had a funny experience in the early 1990s. Uh, one of my grad students uh, who was from China said, oh, I saw the Chinese language version of your, uh, you know, talks with Joe and Lai for four hours. It's been published in China. So I was very curious about that. And he gave me the coordinates. So I went and found it. And every mention of, you know, uh, Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Chunxiao had been taken out. It was as if they weren't even there. And so it's a different you know, it's a different transcript. It's not really the original one. It had been sanitized. So anyway, very interesting. And then in terms of language, no, Joe, Joe spoke English, uh, sorry, Joe spoke Chinese the whole time. Uh, he was from South China. He had a you know heavy accent. It was really, it, that's one of the things I talk about in the sound portion of the book is I talk about how surprised I was because the government is, uh, the government is promoting a universal language, which was called in those days a Putonghua. In Taiwan, it was called a Guoyu, you know, just mean national language. Everyone should, you know, speak the same language. But, you know, and I was aware of that. And that's what I learned in graduate school. The Chinese I learned was the standard, you know, uh, now people call it Mandarin. Uh, but traveling around China, all you heard was dialect people speaking their local dialects. And this was something about their identity and their meaning. And to this day, that's still important. People speak dialects uh, and it has something to do, I mean, think of it, China is the size of Europe. And if we think of you in the provinces in China are the size of European countries. And if we think of Europe, you've got Greece way down south, you've got Norway way up north, you've got Ireland to the west, you've got Hungary to the east. And these people speak different languages, they have different food, they have different customs. That doesn't surprise us when we talk about Europe. Well, China too is like that. And it was certainly like that then. And it is, it is I think, significantly still like that now. So uh, I was interested in his accent, but of course it was difficult to understand. And he, uh, he had a, his official you know, interpreter to interpret you know, uh, uh, as, as, as much as could be interpreted so that there was no misunderstanding about, uh, so the recording had both the Chinese and the English. Great, um, the next set of questions has to do with what you just shared in terms of the differences that you've observed during your first trip. Um, so an anonymous person um, asks whether uh, you think that many of the scenes that you witnessed in your first trip in China were fake if they were set by the party, um, and what did you observe that were um, that you think were more true to life yeah. um, of ordinary uh, people in China? And yeah. uh, Chu Chu Wang, your student, um, she asked a similar question, and and that's um, do, what do you think is the message that the Chinese state was trying to send through uh, your visit? Um, and then um, another person. Uh, Jackie asked a similar question and whether you observed any uh, regional differences in your visit throughout um, China and if you even had an opportunity to meet other foreigners. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, Ed 
Tian asked, um, so if you had take, taken a second trip, so um, after that first trip, when was your second trip and did you have any differences between the first and the second trip? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Let me try to deal with them quickly. Uh, I, do, I don't believe I used the word fake in the book one time. That's precisely why I integrate into the conceptual arrangement of the book, this idea of performance. Performances are going on all the time. Now, if, you, if, if, it, if it helps you to think of these as, oh, it's fake, in the sense that if you go to see a play in the theater uh, in San Diego or New York or London, it, in a way, it's fake. It's a performance. But um, uh, th these were real performances, uh, the big one, the small one for us, and even our performances. Uh, we were trying to present an image of what we wanted people to think Americans were, you know, were, were friendly people, and you know, hey, not everybody would, <laughs> in America was friendly to a China at that time. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I prefer thinking about theatricality and staging and performance. And uh, it, I think it's too simplistic to simply say anything of that sort is fake, uh, because then you're left with the question, well, then how do you actually discover the so-called real. Uh, now, uh, it is true that we were aware that we're going to model units, we're being taken to a unit because this one, you know, excels in this or that, but uh, we would go out walking at night, you know, just go for a walk in the street and because we knew Chinese, uh, you know, you go two or three people would go out for a walk and you would meet citizens, you'd meet people and start chatting with them and people would be amazed that you knew Chinese uh, and you could talk about, you know, all, all sorts of different things. Um, in some cases, people, you know, you'd, you'd see people f literally following you, not, not in any threatening way, but you'd find, you know, you'd stop. Remember in Suzhou, you'd stop for a minute, look around, and there's you know, 40 or 50 people behind you also stopped, and you'd move a little further, and you'd turn around and go back to them and chit-chat. And again, not a whole lot about problematic areas could be learned doing that, but it did make it clear that there is this other reality in addition to all these other performances. And this gets to the issue of uh, the second visit. I didn't get to make my second visit until 1977. Uh, so that's uh, you know, quite a few years later because China was basically from the Lin Biao, uh, uh, you know, death onward, China is a wreck, is a mess. Uh, and uh, this leads to later to the, Mao's death, the arrest of the, his, his followers thrown in jail, gang of four, you know, and so forth. And uh, I had kept on trying to find ways to go back. Um, and using my contacts and so forth, but never got any response. And when I was able to go back finally the next time, I made an inquiry uh, through a, someone I knew uh, in, the, in the foreign ministry. Uh, and uh, it turns out, surprise, surprise, there are files on all of us. Uh, if you've been to China, you know, there's a file on you. Uh, and uh, this person had actually gotten access to my file and said, oh, the reason you couldn't get any response after 1971 is because Mao's wife, Zhang Qing, uh, saw all of you people as friends of Zhou Enlai, and she didn't like Zhou Enlai. And so any request you made, we were trying to launch this rural uh, field research study, uh, you know, wasn't going to happen. Lo and behold, you know, <laughs> literally months after she ends up in jail, uh, we make yet another attempt, this time our Selden and Ed Friedman and I made an attempt to launch a long-term field research project. Uh, we got the go-ahead. We, we were able to do it. So um, I think that, it, so, so, and then after that, I was going annually, sometimes more than once a year, uh, had long stays in China for a year in uh, 1982, 83, and so on. Uh, and I'm still, I go every year. I'm teaching classes at Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University, although this year it's online. Uh, so, uh, and then I think I did touch on the question of the uh, regional differences that really struck me uh, in terms of all these senses, the food, uh, the sound of the dialects and so forth, uh, even the lay of the land, uh, it, it really struck me uh, that we have to think of China more as, you know, uh, Europe in some ways with those kinds of differences. So I think we have time for one last question, so very short, uh, Peter Corrigan. Uh, who was a student at HKU several years ago, he asked if there were any critique of Hong Kong during those days. So we'll let that be a last question and then we'll turn over to Xi to close us. Okay, uh, no, 
Uh, that is to say, to the extent during the trip in China that Hong Kong came up, uh, the, it, the, you know, the, the, the basic line, political line, was that, you know, Hong Kong was part of China and the British colonialists were ruling it. And during the early stages of the Cultural Revolution, there was actually widespread violence uh, in, in Hong Kong uh, with, uh, you know, you know pro-cultural revolution uh, types, you know, were, were setting off bombs uh, in, in buses, in uh, movie theaters. I mean, it was really nasty. There was exchange of uh, gunfire up at the border. Uh, and so at the early stages of the Cultural Revolution, then that quieted down. By the time I got there in uh, fall of 1970, no, there was no more of that kind of talk or that kind of behavior in China. Uh, and then touring China, uh, people, uh, uh, you know, seem to express nothing but, uh, you know, respect for, and, and indeed, I met people in China in subsequent years, sorry, I met people in Hong Kong in subsequent years, who, between my first and second visit, my 1971 and 1977 visit, uh, had actually jumped in the water and swam out to Hong Kong. They wanted to get out of China. They had been sent down youth in the countryside. They couldn't get back to the cities. Uh, and so I had met some of those people later in 1977, 78, 79. Uh, and so uh, it was, uh, you know, and, and there was no, early in the 70s, there was no sense that at some point, you know, when Margaret Thatcher finally makes a deal with Deng Xiaoping, that uh, 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 Hong Kong is going to revert to China. There was, there was no discussion. It was just, you know, British imperialist bad, people of Hong Kong, all really good people, I know, end of story. Let me thank everybody, by the way, because uh, I know this is the end, uh, just speeding by, and I've, I've just touched very briefly on a lot of things that I go into detail in uh, on the book. Uh, and uh, uh, if you found this, you know, interesting, then uh, you might find the, 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 the other material in the book to be of, of, of interest. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that was an incredibly engaging book talk. Um, thank you so much, Pa and Amica and everyone for a uh, amazing discussion. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. If you are interested in seeing photos uh, that are in Pa's book, uh, I encourage you to just uh, Google CCAS and the UCSD library, you will see this uh, digital collection. Um, because we don't have a chat today, so I cannot drop in the link, but uh, it's yearly on you know the top two or top three of the Google search. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Professor Bill Joseph, and I saw your name on the participants list, and the Professor Stephen McKinnon for contributing your photos to uh, CCAS digital collection, uh, and also my uh, wonderful library colleagues for uh, producing the collection. Um, Yes, and if you're interested in participating in uh, more virtual events organized by UC San Diego Library and the China uh, 21st Century China, China Center, uh, please visit uh, library.ucsd.edu and china.ucsd.edu. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>